Madam Speaker, I rise in strong support of H.R. 3678, the Internet Tax Freedom Act Amendments Act, as amended. H.R. 3678, legislation designed to extend the Internet tax moratorium and grandfather protections, clarify the treatment of gross receipts taxes, and revise the definition of Internet access, is bipartisan legislation at its best. It has widespread support by industry groups, including the Don't Tax Our Web Coalition, as well as by various government organizations, such as the National Governors Association, the Federation of Tax Administrators, the National Conference of Mayors, and the National Conference of State Legislators. It is also supported by a wide range of labor and union groups, including the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And with that broad support, the House passed H.R. 3678, by a vote of 405 to 2. H.R. 3678, as amended by the Senate, contains four distinct changes. First, the Senate version extends the moratorium on state and local taxes on internet access and continues grandfather protections for seven years until November 1, 2014. The seven-year time frame will allow Congress to revisit the moratorium and consider de developments in the states or in technology. It will also provide businesses sufficient time to plan and ensure that consumers benefit from tax-free access to the Internet. Second, the Senate version extends from November 1, 2007 to June 30, 2008, the time for certain states to adjust to a phase-out of the grandfather protection. This alteration will benefit state governments who would have scrambled to readjust their budgets with a loss of revenue beginning November 1. Third, the Senate version expands the definition of Internet access to prohibit taxation of certain services which are fee-based, not packaged with Internet access, and are offered from sources other than providers of Internet access. Finally, the Senate version prohibits a state from reimposing Internet access taxes if the state had eliminated the taxes more than two years ago. For nearly 10 years, we have had the luxury of tax-free Internet access as we have operated under a moratorium passed by Congress. But that, the moratorium expi but, that the, but the moratorium expires in less than two days. With the impending end of the moratorium in sight, this chamber agreed nearly unanimously to pass H.R. 3678, the Internet Tax Freedom Act Amendments Act. This legislation is an example of how a bipartisan approach to a complex issue can serve the public good. While the Senate made some changes to H.R. 3678, this is a version I am very proud to support. It retains the essence of H.R. 3678, including refining the definition of Internet access and, most importantly, providing a temporary extension of the moratorium. This legislation minimizes the effect on state and local government revenue, treats businesses fairly, and keeps Internet access affordable to consumers. I remind my colleagues on both sides of the aisle that the current Internet tax moratorium expires in about 36 hours. Madam Speaker, I encourage all my colleagues to join me in supporting H.R. 3678, the amended Internet Tax Freedom Act Amendments Act, so that tax-free access to the Internet can continue, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves her time. The gentleman from Texas. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, I am pleased that we are considering a bill to extend the Internet tax moratorium another seven years. With only two days left until the moratorium expires, it's high time that Congress passes this important legislation and gets it to the President's desk for his signature. Two weeks ago, the House approved H.R. 3678, a bill to extend the Internet tax moratorium for four years. I supported this legislation because it accomplished several positive things. For example, it clarified the definition of Internet access to ensure that states do not tax Internet access, including the acquisition of transmission capabilities. However, I was disappointed that it did not permanently ban taxes on Internet access and e-commerce, and that the House Democratic leadership refused to allow a vote on permanency, even though over 240 members are co-sponsors of a permanent extension. Today, by passing H.R. 3678 with the Senate amendments, we are taking a step in the right direction. This legislation extends the moratorium for seven years, almost doubling what the House approved only two weeks ago. The Senate amendments to H.R. 3678 also made several other important changes to the law. The Senate extended the coverage of the moratorium to all email, regardless of whether it was bundled with Internet access. With respect to the original grandfathered states, the Senate added a new use-it-or-lose-it 
provision that says that if one of those states repeals or otherwise does not enforce its tax on Internet access, it loses its grandfather protections. I think these are good changes to the original House passed bill, and I am happy to support them. By extending the ban on Internet access taxes for a longer period of time, we give businesses the certainty they need to spend billions of dollars to construct, maintain, and update the broadband Internet infrastructure throughout the country. This legislation will help keep the cost of Internet access down so that all individuals can continue to use the great informational tool that is the Internet. While I am disappointed that we are not making the ban permanent, which has wide support in the House, we are certainly moving in the right direction by passing H.R. 3678 today. Hundreds of companies and groups, including AOL, Apple, Americans for Tax Reform, AT&T, Comcast, eBay, Electronic Industries Alliance, Level 3 Communications, the National Association of Manufacturers, National Cable and Telecommunications Association, National Taxpayers Union, Sprint Nextel, Time Warner Communications, T-Mobile, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, U.S. Telecom Association, U.S. Internet Industry Association, Verizon, Yahoo, the Business Software Alliance, and the Hispanic Technology and Telecommunications Partnership, among many, many others, have in fact called for a permanent ban on Internet access taxes. While H.R. 3678 doesn't get us all the way to the goal line, it is a step forward that will benefit the economy and the consumer. Madam Speaker, if we are going to have a healthy economy in America, if we are going to continue to create jobs, if we are going to continue to enjoy a high standard of living, if we are going to continue to increase productivity, we have to do everything we can to encourage and help the high-tech industry. To that end, I support H.R. 3678, though I still would like to see Congress pass a permanent moratorium. And, Madam Speaker, I'll, I'll reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Texas reserves his time. The gentleman from California. Madam Speaker, I would like to yield three minutes to the gentlelady from California, a colleague of mine who's very knowledgeable in Internet tax issues, Ms. Anna Eshoo. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. The gentlewoman for yielding. Madam Speaker, I rise today in support of the amended legislation that's before us. Uh, two weeks ago, when the House uh, brought uh, legislation uh, to the floor uh, on Internet taxation, I was only one of two that opposed it. Now, I opposed it not because uh, I opposed extending a moratorium, quite to the contrary. Uh, I offered legislation with Mr. Goodlatte uh, that would have made uh, Internet taxation um, uh, a ban on it permanent. Uh, we introduced legislation that enjoyed over 240 uh, bipartisan co-sponsors. Uh, that legislation was not considered by the Judiciary Committee uh, or the House. Uh, the bill also contained a loophole that could have opened up the possibility of new taxes on the Internet uh, uh, services, uh, such as email and music downloading. I knew we could do better, and today we are. The Senate amended legislation will establish the longest term for the Internet tax moratorium since it was first created in 1998. The Congress uh, acted on that again in 2001, in 2004, and today's moratorium is the longest that will uh, be adopted. Uh, so I think it's a cause for celebration. Uh, the legislation will guarantee that new barriers created by taxation of the Internet access and e-commerce will not emerge when the current moratorium uh, ends, which is just in, uh, as the chairwoman said, uh, 36 hours uh, away. So we're coming in right under the wire. I think that this is very important policy for our country. Uh, we will, uh, uh, 20 seconds more, Madam Chairwoman. I yield the gentlewoman an additional 30 seconds. Gentlemen's Thank you. Very importantly, this is going to continue to spur innovation, and it will advance our goal of broadband uh, for everyone in the United States. And uh, I'm very, very pleased uh, that the Senate, under the leadership of really the father of this effort, 
uh, Senator Ron Wyden, a uh, new father of twins, a son and a daughter. Um, many congratulations to him. I urge all of my colleagues, this, this should be a 100% vote in the House uh, for a seven-year moratorium. And I thank uh, uh, the leadership for bringing it to the floor and the chairwoman for her leadership on this as well. I yield back. The gentleman yields back her time, the gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll yield five minutes to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Goodlatte, a senior member of the Judiciary Committee and the principal Republican uh, sponsor of the permanent ban on Internet taxes. The gentleman from, from Virginia is recognized for five minutes. Madam Speaker, I ask uh, unanimous consent to revise and extend my remarks. And I Without objection. I thank the gentleman from Texas for his leadership on this issue as well, uh, as well as that of the two gentlewomen from California, Congresswoman Eshoo and Congresswoman Lofgren, who have been uh, advocates of a permanent extension of this legislation. Mad Madam Speaker, I am pleased that the House leadership has now seen fit to schedule a vote on a bill to extend the Internet tax moratorium for longer than the mere four-year extension contained in the House passed bill. However, I am still extremely disappointed that the majority did not allow any amendments to H.R. 3678 when it was considered by the full House. The handling of that bill two weeks ago by the House leadership is unfortunately reflective of the stranglehold that leadership has placed on the will of the majority in this Congress. I had introduced legislation along with Representative Eshoo to make the ban on Internet access taxes permanent, and that legislation had garnered nearly 240 bipartisan co-sponsors before the House was forced to vote on the four-year extension. These co-sponsors represent a strong bipartisan majority of the members of this body. However, with absolutely no explanation, the majority party cut off all opportunity for amendments to that legislation on the House floor, where I have no doubt an amendment to make the ban on access taxes on the Internet permanent would have passed with a very strong majority. During committee consideration, the House Judiciary Committee even resorted to obscure procedural tactics to reverse a vote for an amendment in committee to extend the moratorium from four years to eight years. Because all but one Democrat, Congresswoman Lofgren, on the committee voted against an amendment I offered there to extend the moratorium for six years, I assume that to be consistent, they will vote against the seven-year extension before us today. But we shall see. With regard to the merits of a four-year extension, we heard arguments that the Senate would not accept anything longer than a four-year extension. However, that has proven not to be the case. Now, House leadership has been forced to schedule a vote on a bill to extend the moratorium for seven years because the current moratorium expires tomorrow. It's a shame they did not do this, and more voluntarily, when they had the chance. Instead, the Senate, and I too join in commending Senator Wyden and Senator Sununu in the bipartisan effort that was made in the Senate, which passed a more reasonable bill with a longer term of protection for American taxpayers. The bill before us today extends the moratorium for almost twice as long as the House passed bill, and while I would prefer a permanent ban, this is a vast improvement over current law. This bill will continue to help ensure that the digital divide does not grow between those who can and cannot afford broadband Internet access. The bill will also help ensure that businesses have more certainty when making business decisions about whether to deploy broadband to areas they do not currently serve, such as rural areas across the country. I urge the members of this body to support this important legislation and yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentlewoman from California. Madam Speaker, at this time I'm pleased to yield three minutes to the gentlelady from California, Ms. Lofgren, a colleague of mine on the subcommittee and the Committee on the Judiciary. The gentlewoman from California is recognized for three minutes. Madam Speaker, I rise in support of H.R. 3678. In a welcome and refreshing instance of bipartisan, bicameral cooperation, the Senate took our bill and improved it. The longer moratorium means that service providers will have more certainty when deciding whether to make critical investments in the basic infrastructure of the Internet. The seven-year extension is longer than any that has ever been approved by any previous Congress. Consideration of this bill today shows that Democrats in the 110th Congress truly understand the importance of the Internet to our economy.
Equally important, the bill as amended makes absolutely clear that Internet access embraces ancillary services such as email, instant messaging, and personal storage capacity. This change removes an ambiguity with respect to these services and thereby encourages robust competition among Internet service providers. And importantly, today is October 30th. By passing an extension of the Internet tax moratorium with ample time for the President to sign the bill into law, we avoid the almost certain disruption that would attend any further delay. Failure to act would be a mistake and a step away from the pledges we made in the innovation agenda. I continue to believe that a permanent ban on the taxation of Internet access is important to maintaining imp Im and improving our place in the information economy. I remain a, a proud co-sponsor of my friend Anna Eshoo's bill that would have made the moratorium permanent. I will continue to work with her and Mr. Goodlatte to achieve that goal. But I heartily accept H.R. 3678 as a fair compromise between between our position and the views of those who are reluctant to entirely abandon the possibility of one day taxing the Internet. Ultimately, we will reach the legislative conclusion that taxing the Internet is simply a bad idea. Fortunately, this bill buys us enough time to get there and is an important big step in the right direction. Aside from supporting uh, expansion of the broadband and innovation, it's also good news for American families that they will not face a new tax burden when they utilize the Internet uh, come November 1st. Therefore, I urge my colleagues to join me in supporting this important and very timely legislation. I thank the Chairwoman of the Subcommittee and thank you, Madam Speaker, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlemen, well, gentlewoman yields back her time. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Speaker, I yield three minutes to the gentleman from California, Mr. Campbell. The gentleman from California is recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I thank the gentleman from Texas uh, for yielding. Uh, let's make it clear what this bill does not do. What it does not do is it does not prohibit states or localities from putting general application taxes on Internet transactions as they would apply if that transaction were taking place not on the Internet, for example. It does not ban sales taxes on transactions over the Internet as long as those taxes are the same sales taxes that would be applied if that purchase was transacted in a store or in a, over a, um, a catalog. But what it does do is it says you cannot put discriminatory taxes on the Internet. So you cannot take that sales transaction and tax, give it a sales tax that is higher because it was transacted over the Internet than if it were not. And it also says that you cannot tax access or use to the Internet. Can you imagine, can anyone out there imagine that if every time you sent an email there was a tax that went on your credit card or something for using it, or every time you went on a website there was a tax? That's absolutely unconscionable. And particularly today when we realize how much of the economic growth we've experienced in this decade has come from the Internet and how much distribution of knowledge there has been and how it is a great equalizer that so many people at so many incomes and in so many locations are able to access knowledge that was previously unavailable. Internet has been a great engine for economic growth and for the distribution of knowledge, and we don't want to slow down that engine by taxing it. Now I, like I believe every other speaker this morning, wishes that this bill were a permanent ban. I can't imagine a time when we would want to restrict your access to the Internet by taxing it. However, four years is better than zero, and seven years is better than four. So this seven-year extension is something that I will heartily support. However, I also desperately hope that before we get to the day of the expiration of this next seven-year period, that sometime within this seven years, uh, that this Congress realizes and recognizes once and for all that taxing the access to or use of the Internet is a bad idea and makes this ban permanent in the future. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentlewoman from California. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that a statement by Judiciary Committee Chairman John Conyers explaining the Senate changes be inserted into the record at this point. Is there objection? Without objection. 
Uh, I have no further speakers. I reserve the balance of my time to close. The gentleman from California reserves her time. The gentleman from Texas. Uh, Madam Speaker, how much time remains on each side? Ten and a half uh, from, for your side, Mr. Texas. The gentleman from California has 12 minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, Madam Speaker, I'm going to yield five minutes to the gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Upton, who is a senior member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and also ranking member of that committee's subcommittee on telecommunications and the Internet. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. I thank, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, uh, I thank uh, the gentleman from Texas for allowing uh, myself to have a little bit of time uh, this morning to talk about a very important issue. You know, I'm one of those members of Congress that actually reads and signs all of his legislative mail from their district. And I can remember not too long ago, uh, there was a write-in campaign to every congressional office complaining about a bill that Congressman Snell had introduced that was going to tax the Internet. Every single piece of transaction that one might have on the Internet. And of course, as we know, as we look at this board, and I've served in the Congress, I'd like to say not long enough, but I have never served with a Congressman Snell in the 21 years that Mr. Smith and I have served here together. And I went through it to find out when did Congressman Snell serve. Must have been a Congressman Snell. Well, there was. He served in the 64th Congress. Now, that was a long, long time ago, and I dare say it was before the Internet. It was before Al Gore invented the Internet, and it was before the Senate and the House discovered it as well. But can you imagine taxing every different thing that one might do on the Internet? I look at our own household here and back in Michigan. Often we come home, my wife and I, the first thing we do is we get on the Internet. We check what our daughters might be saying uh, at college. Uh, two nights ago, I was doing uh, some internet surfing, and I got IMs for my daughter, probably about 20, 25. It was a wonderful experience that she and I had communicating. But can you imagine if it was a tax on every single IM message that came back and forth? A lot of us do our banking on the internet, check our different accounts. Can you imagine every single time you're going to get a tax on the internet? For me, I'm a sports nut. My Wolverines. I was on an MGO Blue uh, last night, a couple of different times. When is the Michigan Michigan State get game going to be on this weekend? Can you imagine if you got taxed every time? I wanted to check if Michael Hart was going to play this Saturday. And I checked a dump, uh, bunch of different websites. Can you imagine if you got a tax every single time? That's just nuts. Thank goodness we are extending the current moratorium that otherwise expires this week. Now, I'm one that wanted to make it a permanent extension. I joined with Mr. Goodlatte and Mr. Smith and others as a co-sponsor of legislation to do it so we don't have to do this every single year. We passed in the House a couple weeks ago. A bill was unanimous, in fact, as I recall, that extended it for four years. The Senate finally did something right. They actually extended it beyond four years we're going to see an extension for seven years. Even though it's not permanent, seven years is better than nothing, and that's what we're doing today. But as I think about all the different uses that we use on the Internet today, to think that we would tax every email, every search of the web, all those different things, and as the former chairman of the Telecommunications Subcommittee, I know that this will stifle the growth of the internet in a major, major way. So I would ask all of my colleagues, Republican and Democrat, to support this extension. Let's get it to the president. I'm sure that he'll sign it, hopefully before the week is out, so that we can no longer have the, uh, the audacity to think that a Congressman Snell will come back and, in fact, perhaps introduce a piece of legislation that will solve the uh, the, the, uh, the, that will, in fact, tax every Internet, it would be disastrous. And I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. Uh, I reserve to, my time to close. The gentleman from California reserves her time. The gentleman from uh, Texas. Madam Speaker, we have no other speakers on this side, so I'll yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. H.R. 3678, as amended by the Senate, remains a good, strong bill that provides much needed clarity to the communications and internet industries and strikes an appropriate balance in addressing the needs of states and local governments while helping keep internet access affordable. I urge my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to join me in supporting it, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentlewoman yields back her time. The question is, will the House suspend the rules and concur with the Senate amendment to H.R. 3678? Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. In the opinion of the chair, two-thirds being in Madam the affirmative. Speaker, I ask for the yeas and nays, please. Two-thirds in the, being in the affirmative. The rules are suspended. The Senate amendment is agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The yeas and nays are requested. All those in favor of taking the vote by the yeas and nays will rise and remain standing until counted. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Pursuant to Clause 8 of Rule 20, the Chair's prior announcement. Further proceedings on this motion will be postponed. This is the gentleman from California, Rice. Madam Speaker, by the direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 773 and ask for its immediate consideration. The Clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 140, House Resolution 773, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 3867, to update and expand the procurement programs of the Small Business Administration and for other purposes. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived except those arising under Clause 9 or 10 of Rule 21. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not, ex not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member of the Committee on Small Business. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. The bill shall be considered as read. All points of order against provisions of the bill are waived. Notwithstanding Clause 11 of Rule 18, no amendment to the bill shall be in order except those printed in the report of the Committee on Rules accompanying this resolution. Each such amendment may be offered only in the order printed in the report, may be offered only by a member designated in the report, shall be considered as read, shall be debatable for the time specified in the report, equally divided and controlled by the proponent and an opponent, shall not be subject to amendment and shall not be subject to a demand for division of the question in the House or in the Committee of the Whole. All points of order against such amendments are waived except those arising under Clause 9 or 10 of Rule 21. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the Committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Section 2. During consideration in the House of H.R. 3867 pursuant to this resolution, notwithstanding the operation of the previous question, the Chair may postpone further consideration of the bill to such time as may be designated by the Speaker. The gentleman from California is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Madam Speaker. For the purpose of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Diaz-Balart. All time yielded during consideration of the rules for debate only. I ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days within which to revise and extend their remarks on House Resolution 773. Without objection. Madam Speaker, I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Madam Speaker, House Resolution 773 provides for the consideration of H.R. 3867, the Small Business Contracting Program Improvements Act, under a structured rule. As the clerk reported, the rule provides one hour of general debate, equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking member of the Committee on Small Business. The rule waives all point of order against consideration of the bill except for Clause 9 and 10 of Rule 21. Ten amendments that were submitted to the Rules consider Committee for consideration were made in order. All four Republican amendments that were submitted and six Democratic amendments that were submitted were all made in order. Finally, the rule provides for one motion to recommit with or without instructions. Madam Speaker, through a series of laws and procurement requirements, Congress established a benchmark for the SBA to give small businesses every opportunity to compete fairly for the award of federal contracts. 
Despite a clear mandate that has been in existence for more than 50 years, small businesses have not received their fair share of federal government contracts. This is especially true regarding the service-disabled veterans, men and women, and minority-owned businesses. In 2006 alone, the federal government spent over $417 billion on goods and services, but small businesses have, not, have been continuously losing out on contracting opportunities. This is a tragedy. Small businesses are the engines of our economy. And securing a federal contract is a major financial boon for these entrepreneurs, especially veterans, women, and businesses in low-income areas. We cannot afford our budding entrepreneurs to be shut out of what would, should be an open market and be denied opportunities to succeed, not when their existence is so vital to our economy especially. Madam Speaker, H.R. 3867 takes several critical steps to assist small businesses participation in federal procurement by updating and expanding the SBA's procurement programs. First, it improves contracting opportunities for service-disabled veteran businesses. Today, only 0.87% of federal contracts are granted to service-disabled veteran businesses, a far cry from the 3% goal that was enacted in 1999. H.R. 3867 gives service-disabled veteran businesses priority for federal contracts, providing more opportunities for our nation's veterans to become successful entrepreneurs. It also codifies President Bush's executive order directing agencies to provide veterans resources and assistance they need to participate in federal contracting processes. Second, H.R. 3867 aids women's-owned businesses with federal procurement processes. The Women's Procurement Program was enacted seven years ago to increase the number of contracts awarded to businesses owned by women. However, the SBA has been dragging its feet in implementing the program, costing women tens of thousands of billions of dollars in lost contracting opportunities. H.R. 3867 fully implements the Women's Procurement Program, giving women's owned businesses greater access to, federal, to the federal marketplace. The bill also takes the first step in modernizing the 8A program, which helps minority-owned businesses secure federal contracts, but has not been updated in over 20 years. The bill updates the 8A program to reflect today's economy so that minority-owned businesses have time to grow and graduate from the initiative. Finally, H.R. 3867 continues the Democrats' commitment to combining fraud to, excuse me, to combating fraud and reducing um, and, and eliminate wasting taxpayer dollars. The bill enhances business integrity standards to ensure that taxpayer dollars only go to reputable individuals. It promotes self-policing to allow small businesses to challenge individual program awards. It protects disabled veterans by penalizing firms that falsely represent themselves as service disabled veteran businesses. And it requires on-site reviews by SBA personnel before the hub zone contracts are awarded. Madam Speaker, the bill before us today, H.R. 3867, has extremely strong bipartisan support. It passed the Small Business Committee by a vote of 21 to 4. Among other organizations is supported by the National Federation of Independent Business, the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the National Black Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Women's Chamber of Commerce, the American Legion, and Veterans of Foreign Wars. I would like to thank Chairwoman Velasquez and members of the Small Business Committee for their hard work that went into this piece of legislation. Madam Speaker, we all recognize the importance of small businesses to our economy. It is imperative that we follow through on our commitments to small business and give them every opportunity that we can to succeed. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves his time. The gentleman from Florida. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank my friend, the gentleman from California, Mr. Cardozo, for the time, and I'd yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentleman is recognized. Small business is the engine that drives our economic strength. The almost uh, 26 small businesses, 26 million small businesses in the United States employ over half of all private sector workers and, are, and pay approximately 45 percent of total U.S. Uh, private payroll. Over the last decade, small businesses have generated eight, 60 to 80 percent 
of net new jobs annually. Congress for decades has acknowledged the important role small businesses play in the federal procurement process. Uh, this is evident in the uh, Small Business Act of 1953. The act says that, and I quote, it is the declared policy of the Congress that the government should aid, counsel, assist, and protect the interests of small business concerns in order to preserve free competitive enterprise and to ensure that a fair proportion of the total purchases and contracts or subcontracts for property and services for the government be placed with small business enterprises." End quote. In 2006, the federal government spent over $400 billion on goods and services in uh, over 8 million separate contracts. Small businesses want about $80 billion worth of those contracts, a little over 20 percent. The Veterans Entrepreneurship and Small Business Development Act of 1999 established a goal of 3 percent for federal contracts awarded to service-disabled veterans. Unfortunately, we have yet to meet that worthy goal. The underlying legislation being brought forth to the, to the floor today, H.R. 3867, the Small Business Contracting Improvements Act, seeks to expand procurement opportunities for businesses owned by service-disabled veterans by placing these businesses at the top of the priority list for receiving federal contracts. The legislation adjusts the net worth standard for businesses in the 8A program for the first time in about 20 years to $550,000, so it is more consistent with inflation. To take part in the 8A program, a business must be owned by citizens who are socially and economically disadvantaged. Participants in the program are eligible for sole source and limited competition government contracts. They also can receive a 10 percent cost advantage in some uh, procurements. As part of their uh, campaign, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, the uh, new majority spoke uh, often about uh, taking the House of Representatives in a new direction. Unfortunately, that direction seems to be uh, backwards because now the Rules Committee no longer allows members to present their amendments, uh, even if they're a few minutes late. That is a departure from the practice of the Rules Committee uh, under the prior majority. Uh, last week, several members attempted to file amendments uh, with the Rules Committee. The majority denied the members even the ability to file the amendments because they were a few minutes late, uh, thereby denying members the right even to come before the Rules Committee to speak about the merits of their uh, respective amendments. Representative King attempted to file his amendment on, online as required uh, by the committee. However, due to technical uh, issues, he was not able to file the amendment uh, online. He, Repres Representative King was told by the majority in the Rules Committee that they would waive the electronic filing requirement However, because he had spent time trying to get the amendment filed electron electronically, he missed by a few minutes the deadline to physically file the amendment. It's uh, disappointing that the majority would not allow Representative King to offer his amendment when it was clear he was trying to comply with the filing requirements. But because of technical issues, he was delayed. Now, I understand the need the majority may have in issuing a deadline. But uh, in the prior majority, Madam Speaker, we always allowed members to at least file their amendments even if they were past the deadline and even made some of those uh, amendments in order. It is uh, a shame that the new majority has decided to take a step back and not allow um, some uh, discretion uh, in this matter. This new uh, hard and fast uh, time requirement is particularly difficult, if not impossible, when a member is trying to file a second-degree amendment. 
As you know, Madam Speaker, a second-degree amendment is written to amend an amendment so that it is not possible to draft such an amendment until the initial amendment was made public. And uh, that, uh, that list of amendments uh, filed is not made public until after the amendment uh, deadline. We already saw how the, uh, the new majority's uh, requirement uh, blocks amendments when, during a previous rule, uh, Representative Aiken uh, was not allowed to offer a second-degree amendment. It's unfortunate, Madam Speaker. Um, by not allowing members to even offer amendments in the Rules Committee, uh, we believe that uh, the majority is, uh, is in effect, uh, silencing the voices of millions of Americans. At this time, reserve. Well. That uh, needs to be done by the time that has been specified by the Rules Committee. Timely filed amendments were all made in order on the Republican side for this measure. Uh, we certainly look forward to the Republican, uh, our Republican colleagues filing amendments in committee when we've called for amendments to a bill and uh, encourage them to file on time. Madam Speaker, at this time, I would yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Texas, Ms. Jackson Lee. The gentleman from Texas is recognized for two minutes. Let me thank the distinguished gentleman from California and thank the uh, chairwoman and the uh, ranking member of the full committee on the Small Business Administration uh, and uh, acknowledge the important step that is being made here today uh, dealing with ensuring government op contract opportunities for small businesses owned and controlled by service disabled veterans. We are certainly going to have more of those uh, and every time you meet with a veterans group they wonder uh, what are the opportunities for them? Small business is the backbone of America, and I support this with great enthusiasm. I also hope, however, that this bill does not do harm to the hub zones that have been used by uh, many small businesses across America. And as we review it, I will look closely at this legislation to ensure that hub zones are protected. And I ask the question um, as to uh, the formula that requires a site visit to the business uh, and background checks. I know for sure that many in the minority community use small business as a step of opportunity out of a past that might not have been as strong as they would have liked it to be. People who are rehabilitated, who move forward in life, have an opportunity to provide for their families. And I would hope that that would be uh, the framework of this particular legislation, that we're not doing harm uh, to those opportunities, because this is America. And then I certainly uh, would have wanted to have the amendment that I offered that indicated in times of natural disaster and terrorism uh, that um, small minority and women-owned and disabled veterans' businesses be utilized in the area of the disaster. Certainly, if there is a disaster, those small businesses may be impacted. But what we saw in Hurricane Katrina, uh, we saw the misuse of the small businesses who were there, meaning that they did not have the opportunity to, one, save the government money, but at the same time do the job on behalf of their community of which they loved. And so I um, hope that we will be able to work this language in, maybe through conference, because I think it is an important sense of Congress statement. And I also hope that we will protect those hub zones and make sure that we reaffirm the opportunities for small businesses across America. I'm I inspired. yield back. Gentleman from Florida. I would ask uh, my dear friend uh, how many speakers he has remaining. I have one additional speaker that has arrived. Uh, we we uh, reserve. The gentleman from Florida reserves his time. The gentleman from California. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'd like to, at this time, yield two minutes to the gentlewoman from Arizona, Ms. Giffords. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today in support of the Small Business Contracting Program Improvements Act. Small business, as we all know, is the lifeblood of our communities. Small businesses are responsible for the creativity and the innovation and the community investment. And I honestly believe that a community that has strong small businesses is a strong and vibrant community. This legislation is going to give small businesses in my home state, Southern Arizona, a chance to be competitive with federal contracts, whether it's in Oro Valley down to Green Valley or Tucson all the way to Bisbee and to Douglas. For example, Office Smart in Sierra Vista was founded in 1993 by Glenn McDaniel, who's a veteran, along with his wife, Diane. 
Office Mart has 13 employees and nearly 1,000 commercial customers in Southern Arizona. They compete for federal contact, contracts and to provide office supplies to Fort Huachuca. This bill is going to keep federal contracts benefits targeted at local small businesses like Office Smart in local communities. It honors our commitment to disabled veterans. We know with the war in Iraq and Afghanistan, there's going to be more and more veterans, and also kickstarts the SBA's Women's Procurement Program. As a former president and small business owner myself, I know the importance of small businesses, how difficult it is to compete, and I strongly support passage of this bill. I urge my members on both sides of the aisle to support it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your hard work on this committee and to the chairwoman, and I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back her time. Gentleman from Florida. Well, the, I would ask my friend if he has no other uh, speakers. No other speakers. We'll be ready to close. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam Speaker, I will be asking for a no vote on the previous question so that uh, we can amend this rule and move toward passing a conference report on the Bipartisan Military Construction and Ver Veteran Affairs Appropriations Act. The House of Representatives passed the Veterans and Military Funding Bill on June 15th of this year by a vote of 400, 409 to 2, with the Senate following suit and naming conferees on September 6th of this year. Unfortunately, the majority leadership in the House has refused to move forward on this bill and name conferees. Why has the majority decided to hold off on moving this bill with bipartisan support? Because that's what this is. This legislation has extraordinary bipartisan support. It was almost unanimously passed by this House. Why has the majority decided to hold off on moving this bill forward? Well, according to several publications, Madam Speaker, including Roll Call, the majority intends to hold back in, in sending, from, from sending appropriations bills to President Bush so that they can use an upcoming anticipated veto of one such bill, the Labor HHS appropriations bill, to serve as, and I quote, an extension of their successful public relations campaign on the S-CHIP program. So, uh, for purely uh, partisan tactical reasons, Madam Speaker, the majority is holding back from sending to the President legislation to fund uh, our veterans and military construction. Now, recently, Madam Speaker, Republican leader Boehner took a step towards naming House Republican conferees. Now, Speaker Pelosi should follow suit and take the steps necessary to ensure that work can begin on writing the final veterans funding bill that can be enacted into law. Madam Speaker, every day that the majority chooses not to act to move this legislation forward, our nation's veterans lose $18.5 million. Our veterans deserve better than partisan bickering holding back uh, their funding. So I urge my colleagues uh, to uh, help move this important bipartisan legislation um, forward. Quite frankly, uh, Madam Speaker, it is uh, it's an unfortunate fact to have to report that this is the first time in 20 years where uh, we have reached this date, end of October, and we're still waiting for the first spending bill to be sent to the president uh, for, his, uh, for his signature. It is uh, most unfortunate, most unfortunate. So I urge my colleagues to help move the important legislation, the, the spending bill with regard to veterans and military construction, uh, and uh, to move it forward to send it to the President.
to appoint conferees so that the final product can be sent to the President. Um, for that reason, for that reason, Madam Speaker, we oppose the previous question and urge all of our colleagues to join us in doing so. Madam Speaker, I ask unanimous consent to insert uh, the text of the amendment and extraneous materials immediately prior to the vote on the previous question. Without objection. And, Madam Speaker, at this time, I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. The gentleman from California. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. The gentleman from Florida, my friend, has indicated that uh, we are not, not adequately funding our nation's veterans. I'd like to remind the gentleman, my good friend, that a rec the recent Republican-led Congress shortchanged veterans funding by failing to provide sufficient increases to keep up with VA's a growing number of patients and the rising cost of health care while they were in charge. In the summer of 2005, the VA confronted a $1.5 billion shortfall as they significantly underestimated the health care needs of the new veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. This year, the VA expects to treat 5.8 million patients, 1.6 million more than in 2001. The new Congress, under the Democratic majority, committed to taking the country in a new direction. For 2007, the Democratic-held Congress increased veterans' funding by $5.2 billion, and the Congress is proposing an additional increase of $3.8 billion more than the President in fiscal year 2008. That is the largest increase in veterans' funding in 77 years. Uh, I, I'll not choose to yield at this time, Madam Speaker. The Democratic Congress, once again, is bringing to the floor a bill that provides real solutions to the obstacles facing America's small business owners, innovators, and entrepreneurs. H.R. 3867 ensures that veterans, women, and minority-owned businesses and other, un other represented, underrepresented entrepreneurs receive the assistance they need to thrive in the federal marketplace. It also paves the way for them to develop their companies, create jobs, and give much needed jolt to our economy. Madam Speaker, securing a federal contract is a major boon for entrepreneurs, especially those owned by minority and veteran small businesses. This bill is yet another step towards ensuring that these businesses are not, in fact, left behind, but rather given every opportunity to succeed. I appreciate the debate with my friend from Florida, and I urge a yes vote on the rule and on the previous question. I yield back the balance of my time, and I move the previous question on the resolution. The gentleman yields back his time. The question is on ordering the previous question. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The gentleman from Florida. Request the yeas and nays. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device. Pursuant to Clause 8 and Clause 9 of Rule 20, this 15-minute vote on ordering the previous question on House Resolution 773 will be followed by five-minute votes on adopting the resolution, House Resolution 773, suspending the rules and concurring with the Senate Amendment to H.R. 3678, and suspending the rules and passing House Joint Resolution 58. This is a 15-minute vote. On this vote, the yeas are 398, the nays are zero. Two-thirds being in the affirmative, the rules are suspended. The joint resolution is agreed to. And without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table.